So recording on this computer, making a recording myself. And yes, there it is. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Shall we? Sure. Let's go. Do you introduce Good afternoon, me? ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's with a great pleasure that we welcome Mr. Van Stevens, a very special guest to the uh, second online Blue Ocean Conference. Uh, Vance has a very long history in the field with over 150 publications, and we are so much happy and excited to learn from him. Vance is going to talk about community of practices, which is a totally new idea, especially here in Syria. And we are also excited to hear from you, Vance. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm Vance Stevens. I'm in Penang, Malaysia where the wind is howling outside. I'm, I think I'm pretty safe here where I am. But um, anyway, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Mike here and uh, Benjamin and Sundos and Tatiana. And if you want to speak to me, this is supposed to be a question and answer. Uh, and I just kind of put some slides together. So I guess I could talk for a good half hour if I had to. But um, let me just share the slides. So you can, and by the way, I put in the text chat, can you see the link to my slides, the bit.ly link to my slides? I'll just put it there again while it's in my, my brother. So I, I highly recommend that you open those slides because it has all the links um, that, um, that you'll, well, it has all the links that I'm gonna talk about. So you'll have a lot, and it also has a link to a poll, which is, which we're gonna start out with. So let me just share that. Slideshow. Remember that the majority of people are watching and following through Facebook. So I'll be delivering any questions or. Okay, results. no problem. Happy to, uh, happy to deal with that. Okay, so anyway, this is uh, uh, really about the importance of learning about blended hybrid or e-learning through engagement in communities of practice. So communities of practice for me is where all learning takes place. And um, you learn from, inter from being in the community of practice and you also learn from sharing with the community of practice. So, um, sorry, I just, oh, my presentation is taking up the whole, whole screen. That's okay, it's gonna do that. Uh, and let me just show you where the slides are. I put that link in the uh, text chat. So it's blue 2021 Vance. It's a bit.ly link. So if you go to bit.ly and slash blue 2021 Vance, you can follow this presentation. So I highly recommend that you get that. And the link is on the next slide as well here at the bottom. Did you get the slides? Okay, if you got the slides, uh, you, you can click on this link at the top, which is the poll everywhere.com link. So, uh, Safwan mentioned that uh, he wasn't sure, he said this might be a new topic to people in, uh, in Syria. So let's see. So if you go to pollev.com slash Vance Stevens 602, that's an arbitrarily assigned number, then let's see what, what we can do there. If you, if you need that link again, hang on a minute. Let me just, uh, I'll see if I can get that link. Copy the link, copy the link. Uh, oh, it's not giving it to me. Okay, let me just, did, does anybody need the link? That'll get, that's the link address right there. Okay, I'm gonna put the link address to the poll everywhere in the text chat. Yeah, that, that, that would help. Yes, okay, so if you can go to that, that's a lot easier. Always more than one way to do things. Okay, so uh, I'm trying to, Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to exit my presentation. It was easy to do by accident a second ago, but uh, there we go, I got it. Okay, so what I wanna show you here is the survey. So I'm going to activate the survey and that will allow you to answer questions. So there are four questions and you just scroll down. They're all on one page, so you can just scroll down and get the questions. And so uh, the first question is, are you familiar with the term communities of practice? Yes, very familiar. 
you've heard the term, but you're not really sure about it or no, you don't really know what communities of practice are. So if you could answer those questions, uh, the next question will be, do you consider yourself a member of a community of practice? Yes, definitely, or not sure, or no, you don't. And two more questions. So next to last is how many communities of practice do you consider yourself a member of? Either none, maybe a couple, one to three, or a few, say less than a dozen, or dozens. Uh, so how would you act, how would you answer those? Is is everybody able to did I activate the the link? I tried to do it. Okay. Oh, you restarted the link. I restarted it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I restart it? Well, waiting presentation is on the way as soon as activity is active. You haven't activated the activity. There it I'm comes. activating yep. it now. I keep hitting that active. So let's see. Do I have to present this to do it? Okay, let me see if I present. And, uh, and I haven't activated. This is... You have, you have, but you're turning it off. So just leave it there. And okay. Here we go. All right. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Always need feedback. Cool. So let's see now. So, uh, okay, so I can scroll through the answers and see what people know about the topic already. Okay, so I guess I guess someone will be answering the first. Are you able to answer the first question? If it's not working, it's uh, ah, there yes. we go. Okay. Someone answered. All right, good. It's working. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip on to the next one just to see if someone answers that one. Yes, there are answers to that one. And there's answers to the fourth one. And the fifth one says, uh, what's your favorite community practice? Okay, so we it's have- Broken up into words. Hmm? The, the, the statement got broken up into words. Yes. Mine was Minecraft Academy with Rose Bar. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good to know. Minecraft Academy, Academy with Rosebar. With it's, totally it's totally new. Okay. Uh, classroom come experience emergent. I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway, let me go back and just pick up, uh, see what people are answering here. So let's see. On the first question, uh, I'm not sure how many people have answered. Okay, but all of the people have said they're very familiar with communities of practice. And uh, if we go on, uh, are you a member of a community practice? Someone is not sure. Um, okay, we're gonna address that in the next slide. And how many are you a member of? Okay, one or two so, so far. Uh, all of the answers are there. Okay, so let me, all right, so these are, so if I go back one more time, I'm not gonna dwell too long on this, but is it, anybody want to answer still, or we, maybe I've yeah. illustrated all that I can. Yeah, here I received many answers from people in this year. I say they never heard of it. Oh, okay, but uh, will they answer in the poll or? They didn't put the answers in the poll. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So some people are. Sorry, yeah. I suggest here in the first one, uh, yes, not that familiar with it, and yes, very familiar with it. I was looking for a yes, but not that really familiar with, you know, that would exact be maybe and characteristics maybe of communities of practice. Uh huh. Well, you might want to answer not sure, or or choose one. Well, you just have to choose one because so apparently yeah, two people have answered this question. And at some point we're going to, okay, so uh, are you a member? One person is definitely a member. Uh, how do you know you're a member? If you, because a community of practice is very informal. It's not like you sign up for it. It's just no. sort, of, sort of there. How do you know you're a member? Um, you, you want me to answer, yeah? Sure, you, okay. I don't want to be that, that nerdy student that always gets their <laughs> hand up, but it's good to have a conversation with you, Vance, yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because this is just something that I stumbled upon uh, reading a, a white paper from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, I, I didn't know of community of practice as a term from um, Wetger, is that right? Wetger and... Uh, Winger, uh -huh. yeah, Winger, Winger. Winger mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, and basically what struck me was recently that I was reading about it and I started investigating and, and looking into it was that there is, it's, it is informal, obviously, but there is mm -hmm. a, a rigid structure there, yeah? like mm -hmm. with a leader and, and a uh, focus and, and some tasks. So um, just recently with one or two, like I said, um, um, uh, cops that I've been involved in is I can, I can see the differences because mm -hmm. they explicitly said this is going to be a community practice approach. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it's, it's kind of, a, Wenger is kind of the authority on communities of practice. He, he wrote the books. So uh, he was hired by Xerox to figure out how they could leverage their, uh, what, what they were, what the Japanese were doing in their, uh, in their uh, plants. And he, he wrote, he, he saw they were using the community of practice approach and he uh, informed Xerox of what they were doing, made a lot of money doing that, and then he's kind of gotten, uh, he wrote some books about it. So basically, um, this is Etienne Wenger. Uh, Webheads is one of my communities in practice. I started that in, well, started the, the teachers one in 2001. Uh, no, sorry, 2002. And um, I started as a, an EVO, Electronic Village Online, uh, session and in 2005 2007 and 2009 we had some things we called webheads in action online convergences and the reason we held these convergences was there were a lot of um, conferences coming on at the time but you had to put a credit card down on them they weren't free and um, there really was nothing i thought that webheads could actually put one on for free and that's what we did and the one in 2007, we had Etienne Winger come out and he came online and he talked to us. And Christina Costa, I don't know if you know Christina Costa, but before she was a PhD, successful PhD, uh, she spoke to Etienne and he, they were talking about com communities in practice. He, he said, how did you know you were in a community of practice? And she said, when I saw my practice had changed. See, that's the straight A answer right there. That's, that's what you're supposed to say. And that's really, Communities of practice should result in some change in practice. Okay, so if uh, as a result of interacting with people, you change your practice, then that's then quite possibly you are in a community of practice. And um, this link down here will take you back to other uh, other webheads and action online convergences. And uh, that's the slide where this comes from. Okay, it's a slide on. PLNs. So if you want to explore more, you can always do that in my slideshows. So characteristics of COPs, actually, we, we looked at them over here. There's a domain, there's a community, and a practice. So these are uh, Wenger's terms, how he defined communities of practice. The domain is the thing that you are talking about. So for example, we're language teachers. Uh, that's our domain. We're interested in things associated with language teaching, maybe technology. Uh, we have a community. We, uh, Zafon has a, a web page, a, a Facebook page, and that's a community. He's starting a community there. You're starting great relationships building. Obviously, Mike and I know each other and um, because we, we work through Electronic Village Online. And the practice is the things that you, that's what changed, what Christina said when her practice changed. This is the things that you do uh, in order in within that domain. So when so it's, it's those things right there. And so uh, Etienne Winger wrote books about these things. There's uh, knowledge is promoted in a domain. They revolve around practice. And the communities also have other aspects. And one of them is that they spontaneously or voluntarily form. It's kind of hard to start one. That's what, what I was asking Mike, uh, he, he said that he, some people said they were gonna use that approach. Yeah, it's an approach, okay. Uh, but to really form a community practice, the people have to be there because they're really uh, getting key, uh, keen on that. And uh, it has uh, particularly defined community spaces in which they interact. Okay, and Webheads in Action, 
it, those spaces are all over the board. You might even say EVO, they're all over the board. So we're gonna look a, bit, a little bit about how that works. So uh, we have groups, communities, communities of practice and networks. So networks are kind of by definition connectivist. That is they, they people interact with each other and um, they can be called PLNs, personal learning networks or distributed learning networks. Those are ones that are online as opposed to ones that are maybe you do by the mail or something like that. And rhizomatic learning is something that Dave Cormier has been promoting. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of that. It's irrelevant to this talk, but let's, let's look and see how those things work. So a group is any group of people, we could, we could say we're a group right now, we're grouped here in this uh, Zoom room. And if we meet with other groups, we would form a community. So for example, if you live, there are four people in your house and next door there's four more people and four more people in the house over there, they're in a community, call them a community. And a community of practice is when these people have things in common. They interact, they're there because they have, they're interested in the same domain. Uh, they're uh, the, the, uh, the connections with each other, they're forming social connections and they are engaged in the same practice. So networks now makes things kind of interesting. Networks can have overlapping communities. So you see there's three communities there and they overlap, they all overlap in the middle and then uh, I've sort of set the diagram where the two of them might overlap. So uh, what this looks like is you might have people in the different communities might interact with each other. For example, uh, Mike might be in a flipped learning community, uh, a community of practice perhaps. And I might be in Minecraft, I play Minecraft. So well, actually Mike is actually interacted with us in Minecraft sometimes. So yeah. you might say that, uh, I'm in this community, he's in this one, and sometimes he interacts with us in the Minecraft community. Now, people in any, any node, each of these gray things is called a node. Any node in the community is liable to be interacting with a node in another community. So this is your network. And Stephen Downs says that each node in the network is as knowledgeable as the most knowledgeable node in the network. What that means is if you want some information, like today I was trying to find out uh, how many people you can get on a Minecraft server, which is not just a straightforward answer. It depends on RAM, it depends on lots of things, on the CPU. Uh, so anyway, I just put that out in, in our Discord network and uh, Aaron came back and answered me. Okay, so he's knowledgeable. I'm in contact with Aaron. And um, so I can get information somewhere in the it could be someone in another community though it could be someone else could have answered that question but what this means is that this guy right here is as knowledgeable as this person over here because they have access to the same information as siemens used to say that the the pipes are more important than the content what that means is that your network connections are more important than the content in the pipes Pipes can have content, but if you can't get at that content, then your pipes or your connections are, need to be revised. So as long as you have connections to other networks, other communities, then you are theoretically as knowledgeable as the most knowledgeable person in that network. So I've written a, a bit about autonomy. And what... what uh, what that means is that autonomy, let's see, autonomy is um, when people have a learning strategy that directs them toward, um, toward a, something they want to learn. Uh, they develop it themselves so that they're autonomous. And teachers who agree that learning, learner autonomy is something that should be encouraged and developed in students should see the need to cultivate autonomy in themselves. So teachers have to be autonomous in order to get their students to be autonomous. Often in uh, PD situations, professional development situations, sometimes they don't work so well because they might be driven top down. Uh, they don't really address teacher needs. Uh, someone puts them on for an excuse for something else. They don't necessarily lead to development. People just have to go there and sit through them. 
but teachers who drive their own professional development through participation in learning communities and PLNs, personal learning networks, are constantly expressing and accessing each other's needs, promoting professional development on an as needed basis. So once you are familiar with and comfortable in this style of learning, then your students, you'll, you'll apply it to your students. So uh, as Mike said, they were, they were going to use a uh, community of practice approach. Well, okay, so they're modeling a community of practice approach. So this to me is the relationship between communities of practice and the practice itself. Can you hear the thunder? Yes. Sure <laughs> thought. Okay, so an autonomous learner is one who still starts him or herself. Oh, by, by the way, I've got, if you want to read more about these things, it's coming from my blog posts, uh, or this one over here is uh, coming from uh, something I published in a Learning Independence Newsletter, and I also wrote a blog post here about it. So these are just quotes from these posts. If you want to read the rest of the posts, you can. So um, an autonomous learner self-starts him or herself in the direction of learning strategy, which probably is going to be centered around a learning community these days. So therefore learning strategies leading to community and network building might be productive in producing autonomous learners, some of whom also work as teachers. So just because you're a learner, don't forget to include yourself, okay? Teachers are also learning. Any questions so far? Um, there yes. was one about the meaning of PLN. Personal Learning Network. Right. Mm -hmm. That's huge. You want to touch on that? I think that's, that's a, a huge topic, which um, you should talk about what is a PLN and, and why have it maybe, you know, the professionalism of, of a teacher connecting with other teachers. It's especially in the pandemic uh, with a lot of online stuff. Um, uh, connecting with other teachers is, you know, was and is huge. And mm -hmm. because of the pressure to perform digitally, like Vance, it's easy to, you know, no, I shouldn't say that. But Vance's been doing it for, you know, many years. So have a, a teacher of a, a physical classroom with little or no connection to the internet, all of a sudden have this huge burden to take on, you know, whatever the context is, 10, 15, 20, 30 kids plus, Mm -hmm. and have them all online was huge mm -hmm. and one of the ways because you know governments didn't catch on no no government didn't catch on or governing body i should say and one of the ways teachers survive was connecting to each other and yes. learning from each other yes right and exactly. having the right you know teachers connected to you on maybe social media maybe just a facebook or twitter or whatever you use mm -hmm. uh is invaluable you should if you just use it to uh, look at, you know, family connections, make an account as a teacher and connect with other teachers. And you'll see how everything just connects and you yes. learn. Yeah. And obviously, um, uh, Blue Ocean knows that. And that's why he's doing this tremendous effort to. Um, as a good example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's using his personal learning network to connect to all these teachers are bringing some outstanding presentations into his uh, into his context. So uh, he's a very good example of that. Yeah. So uh, anyhow, these these next three slides are from this presentation. Uh, this is over here. It's uh, from my flipped learning workshops in Thailand. I just took three slides from that. It'll come in a minute right here. These three slides. They were also from my workshops. Um, my workshops in Thailand. So I took those and I put them here. And these are, and I'm having trouble getting back to the presentation. I guess it doesn't really matter. Okay, so anyhow, oh, I know what I have to do. I have to move on like there. There we go. Okay, that'll go forward, go back. That puts me back in the presentation. <laughs> so I, I gave a, a plenary address in Egypt in 2004, some long time ago in which I said, there is no such thing as a language teacher. There are only language learners. What do you think about that? Mm. Is there such a thing as a language teacher? I mean, we all have jobs as language teachers, but are you really, can you really teach a language? Is it possible? Mm, yes, I believe. 
I, okay, let me just quibble with that. Uh, you can probably train the language, but as you, you're giving people a test, uh, if you want to learn, people to learn verb conjugations and you can sort of grill them in it, they'll do well on the test. But as far as going outside that context into the real world, they're probably not learning a lot about the language. They have to learn, they have uh, mechanisms in their head that help them learn languages. And they're, I, this is just to be provocative. I'm not going to stand by this, but I'm saying that there's no, there are only language learners. Language has to be learned. It can't really be taught. It can you can facilitate the teaching. As you, as a teacher, you're a facilitator. But I'll, I'll look at some other people's perspectives on this. This guy is named Stephen Downs, at another Webheads in Action Online Convergences. He came and talked to us. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Stephen Downs. Let's see if he's got, oh, the, oh these slides don't go, that, that link is broken, I just noticed it earlier. Okay, so he said that a teacher models and demonstrates and a learner practices and reflects. Do you, does that, is that what the teachers do? Do they model and demonstrate and do learners practice and reflect? Is that, do you agree with that? One of the teacher's part is to model and to show and demonstrate and then to create the environment, uh -huh. which will help learners, you know, facilitating, you know, the learners uh -huh. to practice and okay and take in. Would you ever have students model and demonstrate or do you practice and reflect? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who does what? Mm -hmm. It's a bit, a bit hazy. Yeah, keep going. Okay, well, this is David Warlick's uh, concept of a master learner, which he wrote about in this blog post. You can read it if you want in 2010. And he said he tried to present himself as a master learner, suggesting that part of what teachers should be today is constant and resourceful learners. The, the idea of a master learner is that you're not a, a teacher. It's kind of like apprenticing. You, once you, you become an apprentice learner and do it so well to the point that you can actually be hired to teach, you're actually teaching people how to learn. That's what you should be doing anyway. So that's why I say that there's no such thing as a language teacher, They're just master learners maybe. Uh, but in, in order to become proficient in the language or to communicate with others, you have to learn the language yourself. Uh, teacher, uh, Stephen says, teachers model and demonstrate, learners practice and reflect. So if you take this schematic, the master learner in, in uh, Warlick's scheme, master learners model, demonstrate, practice, and reflect. It's percolation. They're always demonstrating, reflecting on that, changing things, you know, so they're always learning. So uh, that's a concept that's been with me for quite a long time. And then getting to your point, Mike, where when teachers were put in the situation where they had to get in and start teaching. Uh, my courses in Thailand finished up in an e-learning course, and this is from the e-learning course. Uh, one of the people in the course said, I wouldn't even be, know where to begin teaching my classes online this semester. But that's a, a, that's a pretty, that's pretty, yeah, pe people, yeah, uh, people, I'm hearing myself on an echo, by the way. Um, I thought someone was talking to me. Okay, so anyway, Maybe other people have headphones or can, or, or maybe mute your mic if you're not talking. You're not talking. Yeah, because it's coming back to me and it's, it's confusing me a little bit. Maybe, or can we, can we mute people who are so not Maybe speaking? we can mute everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mona is still, let's see, it's still happening. Yep. Must be Mona. Hate to point, right. embarrass anybody. Okay, so anyhow, uh, this guy down here is Jeff LeBeau. And Jeff is someone I've been interacting with for a long time. I'm gonna have to fix that echo problem. Let me see if I can get into the Zoom. And if I go into Zoom, oh, stop the share. Okay, there we go. So this one right here, let's see, Mona, let's see if we can. Uh, mm, okay, she doesn't. She doesn't have a, a mic showing. Okay, 
Hey, well, maybe it's not her. It could only be Safwan. It's not me at all. No, okay. Well, okay, so they're only, uh, we're only showing. Oh, wait, stop now. No, that's not right. Okay, anyway, enough troubleshooting. We're just going to deal with it. Okay, so um, let me get back into the share. Sorry about that little aside. Okay, so I was talking about Jeff Lebeau, one of my colleagues who I've been interacting with for a long time. Uh, Jeff came to my e-learning course, and he uh, he showed he showed us he, he's very good. He's like uh, he's very experienced at. Uh, uh, he was long time experienced in blended learning and uh, going online with teachers. And he had so much experience with that when he went to Korea and was teaching there. He, uh, he had just set things up in a blog. And he, the way he had done it in the blog was he, he, all these little orange things are tabs in the blog, and they each have to do with some course component. The, the echo has stopped, by the way. Okay, so um, he was head of his department. So what this meant was that for his teachers, he was able to uh, put them into the system. So he, he said, if you can listen to his recording, he said that uh, um, they were able to easily seg into this emergency re remote teaching uh, phase and just add Zoom is all he said. But uh, that's, that's a little simplistic. But in any event, by having the experience of doing it, uh, you are then able to, sorry, now I gotta get out of this thing. Okay, so there we go, okay. <laughs> okay, so that it, having the, doing it, uh, having the experience of doing it makes you, it much easier to actually do it yourself. And you're not so much in that position of having to figure it out. So anyway, uh, getting into my own communities of practice, uh, the one I started in 1998 with, uh, students, we had the students uh, writing, for, we call it writing for web heads. And uh, that attracted teachers who uh, started joining us and coming online in audio and uh, using some of the tools we were using back then. Um, there's this webheads.info is where you can learn all about web heads. And so there's writing for web heads, for example, where you can see uh, the students who are in the writing for web heads, they're still there. Um, our webheads and action online convergences are up here somewhere. That's it right there. Okay, so you can learn about the three webheads and action online convergences. Anything you want to know about webheads uh, is all there. And also some of the, uh, the things we've written about them. For example, the, what I'm showing you right now, there's an article about webheads. Um, there's, it's an encyclopedia article, which I'm kind of proud of. So um, if you want to read more about that, uh, you can go to the encyclopedia there, and there's my article here. It's uh, up on my website. Okay, a better one though, where I really explain how the parts fit together is a chapter that I wrote for uh, computer assisted language learning uh, for Apical, John Baison. Let me just have a look at, at that one right there. So if you open it up and go down to where the article is, it's a, you can see that I address a lot of these issues and explain how they come together. For example, let's see, writing for web heads, how that got started, uh, how we learned how to um, make autonomous learners, how to, how to develop skills that we were able to uh, bring into even higher and higher uh, accomplishments. So web heads in action, um, there's something on personal learning networks right there learning via communities of practice and personal learning networks. If you want more information about that, you can read that. And the ineffable nature of connectivist learning. Ineffable means you can't really describe it. You have to do it. Um, ineffable is something that you, yeah, yeah okay. I don't, if you don't know the term. Anyway, it's, it describes something that, like uh, playing Minecraft, uh, is not something you can understand how it could help your students until you do it. And WebEd's National Online Convergence, uh, some of the other uh, EVO sessions that I was doing at the time. 
So all these things, uh, they're described there in this article. Okay, so WebEd's in action happened three times. It drove me crazy. It was um, kind of a three day, 76 hour straight event. Didn't really sleep very well. It was so difficult that I decided in 2010 that I would do it. Um, I'm gonna let Anas in. Can I do that? Because they're on my screen. Okay, so um, there were, uh, since 2010, I changed this into Learning Together, which was more, uh, not just a conference, but weekly, weekly, um, uh, weekly podcasts. And you can see all the podcasts here. This is uh, a, an index of all the podcasts that we've done. So if you, they're all listed there, they're, they're all recorded. So all 510 of them now, you can get them all right there. And now I'm gonna start talking about how this fits into uh, communities of practice because Learning Together is one of my communities of practice. That's the link for it, learningtogether.pbworks.com. And uh, what this does is it gives you events that are coming up. So if you want to join events that are coming up, you can see what's happening in my communities of practice, in my Learning Together community of practice. So um, on the 1st of May, David Wiley is gonna talk. Uh, that's, he's a very interesting speaker. Anyway, so you can find out more things that are happening and you can become involved with some of the, the people who are doing those things. Okay, so that's the next topic is how can you get involved in communities of practice? So Learning Together uh, has a Facebook group as well. People are starting to post in the Facebook group like Hannah Hamis posted this and just below that Faisal al-Shamali in Oman. And this is just a bunch of, a set of um, events that people posted about. And so it's just an example of how people are using the community of practice to kind of inform each other about things that are coming up. Webheads in Action does pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's also a Facebook group. We, it's, it's probably the most active part of Webheads in Action right now. Uh, let's see if, other people are, there, there's somebody posting about um, Selby uh, Evans, I think is his name. He's posting about, there's Hana again. He's posting about uh, virtual worlds. Uh, so there's Selby, he, he posts a lot about virtual worlds events. Electronic Village Online though, that's one I, that's, that's the most important one I think. Electronic Village Online, let's see. It, uh, I, I've co been a coordinator since 2003. I mentioned that I'd started WebEds in Action in 2002. And then in 2003, they asked me to be a coordinator. And um, I wrote uh, this article here about autonomy uh, meets Electronic Village Online. That's just a, an article that touches on some of the things I've been talking about already. And then uh, Elizabeth Hanson Smith and Christine Bauer Ramazani, two of the original coordinators, uh, wrote an article in 2004 where they described sort of how uh, how EVO was formed, Electronic Village Online. So, and by the way, we're in our 20th anniversary now. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go to EVO Sessions, which is evosessions.pbworks.com, and. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is put out a call for proposals in July. And so we'll start the next cycle of uh, Elon Electronic Village online um, uh, present uh, sessions that, that happen every year from January and February. Okay, so it's a community of, oh, a community of practice at work. This is, uh, you, you can read in two places about this uh, what happened in 2020, and that is the TESOL conference was uh, canceled in 2020. It was supposed to be in Denver. We had already, because modeling how if you do things in a certain way, you know, if you, if you do things online, if you work in this blended learning way, if you're working through communities, what we were doing was at TESOL conferences. We were... Uh, 10 years ago, we were holding 
the Electronic Village Online sessions where a few of the moderators came to the conferences and spoke. And then we started moving uh, in, I think, 2016 and 17. We had the best at Electronic Village Online where we tried to get the people who came to the conference would uh, speak physically at the conference about what they were doing. In 2018, they decided to move the Electronic Village down to the exhibition hall. And so they wanted a lot bigger event, more people there, and they also increased the time. But the trouble was, this is in 2018, the economy is starting to pinch, people aren't really traveling, people who are doing courses online, are they do everything online, they're not really relying on being in physical spaces. So they, um, they didn't come, you know, they, we only had uh, four or five people who were actually moderators there. And so to compensate for that, I decided to, uh, we had always, we had been streaming what we do out to the world at large from our uh, electronic village online. Um, this is the part of TESOL conferences where Cal IS has uh, events that are kind of separate from the main conference. So in 2000, 18 and 2019, we couldn't get enough people to fill all the time they had allocated to us so on site. So we decided to bring them in from online. So we organized in a Google Doc the presentations that would happen. Some of them happened on site. People just signed up for the slots. Other people came from online and we put together, we had audiences sitting there listening, didn't Someone was standing up at the podium speaking, that's one thing, or they could see it on the screen. So audiences seem to tolerate this quite well. That brings us up to 2020, when all of us, we, we set up the same event, but all of a sudden the conference was canceled. But we didn't cancel, we went ahead and uh, put it online. So we, we did it entirely online. And the significant thing here is that we did it, not only just had a, separate event, but we had it at about the time that it would have been done in the conference. So in other words, we didn't hardly skip a beat. Uh, we put on the event because we had already been doing that kind of thing. So I think we were probably the only uh, session at the TESOL conference who was able to do that, who was able to actually put on their presentation. And then the, the last one, 2021 has been, uh, has been, sorry. Uh, okay. Somehow got into a. I'm getting messed up here. Okay, there we go. There's my slides. Okay, so, um, so that's a, a community practice at work, uh, but we're quite often at play. Uh, I've been for the last seven years uh, moderating something called EVO Minecraft MOOC, and this is play and work. Uh, in order to Minecraft is one of the things that it's really hard. You, it's almost impossible to do without a community. I mean, you can do it. You can get the software and you can run the software, but you can't really understand how it can lead to communication among light machine learners until you get online with a community. And that also you'll progress in the game a lot faster than if you try to do it by yourself. So I started EVO Minecraft MOOC in 2015 when I didn't know how to play Minecraft. I just wanted to be taught or I wanted to learn, put it that way, like a language learner, I had to put myself in a position where I could learn. So I gathered together some experts and we taught each other how to play Minecraft. And seven years later, I'm sort of in the position where I can teach other people. So uh, at the TESOL 2021 20, conference, I uh, there's some videos you can watch about uh, how we, uh, how, what, what they tell you is that I, uh, in Minecraft, let me just pop back over here. Let's see. Okay, if I go to that's our our portal page for EVO Minecraft MOOC. There is uh, what I what we do is we record live events, and so these are some of the live events we recorded. So a couple dozen of them, and um, like for example, uh, Dakota Redstone, one of our moderators, took us off into uh, what's called the end. And it's a very dangerous place, but as a community, you can go there and you can survive it and you can succeed in getting the dragon's head or whatever it is you're looking for. So um, 
I what I did was I I drew up a set of affordances that I thought Minecraft gave to language learners. I extracted 13 video snippets and I put them into these uh, into this video. So I have a lot of documentation explaining how the snippets, examples from the snippets from the 13 videos from all the couple dozen uh, videos I made, taking parts of those out that show you how people can uh, learn languages through them. Okay, whoops. Sorry about that. Okay, now then, I'm kind of done. Uh, I have a Padlet here. Let's see if I can get its link. I'll put the link in the text chat. If you would like to write on the tablet, on the Padlet, you can, uh, you'll find a, there's a little plus bar. Once you mouse over the plus bar, it turns into a, an editing pen. But if you hit the plus bar, you can write down any thing you'd like to tell us about communities of practice. And that's where I plan to let you write there. And I will find the text chat. Where's my text chat? Here it is. Okay. Too many windows open. Oh, I need to stop sharing. Okay. So uh, there we go. So in the text chat, here's the Padlet. Padlets are, are very nice tools for just getting people to reflect on what you've been talking about. Um, I'm going to bring it up here. If I notice that anybody is writing in it, I will show it to everybody. Okay. So my Padlet is up now. So at the moment, I'm not expecting everybody to rush to it. But if you're doing flipped learning, I don't know, Mike, you probably use Padlets and flipped learning. This is a good ways to get people to consolidate and reflect on your own. Somebody's there. Benjamin is there. OK. Yep. Uh, how do you reconcile community goals with individual goals within a COP approach? That's a good question. How do you community go? Well, you know, the, the, because they're put on by people who are sharing the same practice and ostensibly going for the same goals, they are the same. Community goal, individual goals are community goals. So let me go ahead and share this since it's becoming kind of productive. Okay, let's see. Uh, there we go. Lots of screens to manipulate here. Okay, now there's the uh, Padlet that I started. So here we have, um, Mike says, I feel communities, the COPs are a great way to learn from peers. Sometimes the content, he's not, he's not finished yet. Okay, so, oh, no, it worked that way. So yeah, how do you reconcile community goals with individual goals within a COP? They really shouldn't diverge. Uh, all my COPs, you know, th there is a there is a question. You know, Webheads is well known because it, it it's a it takes a cat herding approach. I'm a cat herder. Uh, no one has an agenda. People have remarked on that. So if you get people in the community who have agendas, you might. Um, you might find that individuals aren't really on the someone's agenda goals, but if things are left for people to work organically, uh, I think people take from a community of practice what will benefit them and two people can have different goals and still take the same thing from the community of practice. Okay. Is any affiliation between CSL theory and other round rule like ITA is COP? Okay, I'm not sure what the, the too many acronyms there. Is any affiliation between TSOL theory and others around the world like ITA, uh, like ITA is a COP? That's a good question. You know, well, I mean, what you're asking is are any of the things that you already do a COP? Um, I'm not sure what ITA is. But um, maybe someone could explain it to us. Uh, the International Diesel Assist Association. Ah, okay. Ah, I do. Oh, I see. I've never seen that acronym before, although I know they changed their name. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, ITA has what they call COPs, 
uh, they tried to organize around COPs. You could say that the intersections are often COPs. I would say that the Cal IS intersection is definitely a COP because the people there seem pretty focused on the same domain, the same uh, uh, goals within that domain, the same practice. So, and they also, uh, uh, they, and they're, they're very community based. So let's see, I don't know, Mike, do you want to talk to us about what you've written here? Um, yeah, sure. Basically, um, I say that um, sometimes the, the content of a, of a COP can be so overwhelming and uh, I, I prefer if I'm involved in the COP, if there's some sort of a leader or someone who is leading the, the focus group or the, the focus of, of the, the content and breaking it down into like bite-sized chunks and maybe a task and the reflection stage. So that way you're, you're all involved because you know, I, 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 I have a language school and I've got something like um, uh, 10, 10 teachers and having a Facebook group or a messenger group sometimes, yep, yeah, um, if there's no task involved, it's even difficult getting your teachers just to like maybe your, uh, uh, a link you've, you've, uh, you've put on this Facebook group. But if they know that it's, this is, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, community of practice, and this is a task, we're talking about maybe recovery notebooks, or we're talking about uh, different ways we're gonna do something in our school. And, and you break the, the, the ideas down and you, you get everyone reflecting and, and participating, it's, it's more productive. Yeah, COPs, I think the, the impetus should come from the people um, I, I don't know, are you thinking about a MOOC? Is, you know, some of the things you said might pertain to a MOOC, which is a course that has no well, center. Is, do our EVO sessions considered MOOCs? Well, yeah, you know, we say that, I say that. Uh, I think they're MOOCs. They're massive. They have hundreds of people in them. Or, you know, I also have another term I call minuscule open online course. So it could be a minuscule open online course. Same dynamics, yeah. Uh, but but basically, you want enough people in the MOOC that it's gonna that it's kind of like having a party. If you only invite a few people, half of them show up. It's not much of a party. If you invite the whole neighborhood, you know, a third of them show up, you're gonna have a wild party. So, but in a party, they're all participating. In a MOOC, there's you know, you could have like 180 participants and only get you know three tasks done or you know ten tasks. Yeah, or from this the, the Padlet, we've got you mm. know quite a few participants on Facebook and and what have you, but we've only got two posts. But they're they're stimulating discussion, and yep. um, and also you know the a lot of people uh, join MOOCs but don't really do anything. I mean, I I lurk in a lot of MOOCs, and I've probably joined ten times, fifty times as many MOOCs as I've actually participated in. You know, just to see what what they're doing, or I'll get into a MOOC for long enough to where I think I'm lear I've learned what I want to learn and then I move on to something else. Yeah. So, but that's, that's normal. Uh, it's been said that, you know, if you did, if you put on a university course and you might get say 20 people signed up for it and you might get 10 people out the other side. If you put on a MOOC and you get a hundred people, you're likely to get 20 people out the other side. So yeah. um, the, the, the uh, scale means that it's productive and yeah. yeah so the and and MOOCs can be very the reason I, I thought you might be thinking about MOOCs was because they, they also lack center the MOOCs um, can be very confusing uh, there's so many things going on or there's so many there's even participants will create spaces for the MOOC to uh, interact in so it's they're not really controlled very well and that's the they're sort of meant to be like that, but uh, communities of practice, I think, are not really necessarily task-based. They're for people to learn through, um, uh, I mean, a MOOC is a, a massive open online course. It's a course. That means that there are tasks. So you should have, you should do things there. A community of practice is a community of people who uh, might not have tasks, but they're learning and they're sharing the knowledge. So. They may not have tasks. They may not do it through tasks. They may just uh, post to Facebook or, you know what I mean? There's 
they're share they're they're they enjoy interacting with each other because they're learning from each other so yeah but in mm -hmm. in a community practice they don't they don't you mean if you set up a community practice they're not learning from each yeah, other yeah i'm a bit hazy because for me community practice is something that i picked up really recently uh -huh. but but i have been maybe involved in in that's why i only said one or two uh -huh. because they've, they've been branded maybe community of practice and, uh -huh. I, and i'm understanding that it's focused like i'm in a uh, ludic language pedagogy uh -huh. call yeah okay. and it's very focused and uh we read a lot of papers and we talk about them and and, and just that they could that the discussions could go anywhere uh -huh. uh, on a discord server but um and whereas you know um and I always feel that it's focus, and when it gets unfocused, you you move on. That's like that's why I can't, I'm a bit hazy with the term. Well, you take something like webheads as a community practice. I mean, there there people are. There's never been any tasks to do. People just no, yeah. like to get together and talk about things, and they, and they ask questions to the group, and they help each other. So, um, a community practice is something that's voluntary. People. You shouldn't feel that you're having to do something in a COP. You know, you, you, uh, whereas if you're trying to get through a course or a MOOC, then yeah. uh, the, they might give you a certificate at the end if you accomplish tasks. But um, you know, if, you, if you're trying to keep up that kind of pressure, it doesn't sound like it's going to go for very long or there must be an end to it. The yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if you really, so mm -hmm. it's more of a, the community practice, more of, you know, a group of people, same passion, same beliefs, maybe, and they, they learn from interacting and, and sharing and reflecting. Yeah. Something like, you know, the, the social nature of learning, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, right? they come to, they meet uh, together and they have each other and they utilize each other by uh, sharing with one another, learning from one another. Uh, they might, address a particular problem. Someone might have a problem. Uh, my school just closed. What do I do now? You know, so, it, but it, it wouldn't, you'd never set up a thing to read about schools closing. Although people might share that kind of stuff, you know, so, um, but you would, it's, it's more uh, just in time and uh, more based on people's needs, um, you know, based on any pressure or obligation to do something that would be yeah how, but but you know you could be redefining it i don't know you know uh, wanger has very particular uh, um, um, criteria for communities of practice and so those three are simplified but then it gets much deeper into them in his books it's been long mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's quite funny because i picked up uh even though um I've seen a lot of your content and we've talked uh, uh, um, together quite a bit of times and then I've attended a few webhead sessions as well. I really didn't pick up on the term, see, you know, community of practice. Mm -hmm. And it's quite funny because I found it just recently in uh, a white paper from Microsoft, mm -hmm. Transformational Framework, Learning Communities and Support. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And... Um, they say, you know, learning communities offer a power. Maybe I can share because it's a it's a shareable document. Mm -hmm. You want to share? You want to share a screen? Uh, give me a sec. Let me. I can share the paper. Maybe someone can read it. Uh, and basically, uh, the thing I caught: learning communities and support. Learning communities offer a powerful strategy for supporting teacher professional development um blah 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 as an organizational structure they share a collective responsibilities for the growth and development of all members in the school and schooling system so structuring bringing together blah 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 and bringing together maybe teachers and and, and maybe even the community and, and students through a community of practice do you think that's feasible is my question where, where are you reading what page no oh, because Maybe I can share it. Sure. Uh, learning communities and support. Give me a sec. Okay. Let's see. Are we violating any time frame here? 
Oh, yeah. I hope not. Oh, just after the introduction. Okay. Second paragraph, yeah? Uh, second. Six. Here? Th this page? Yeah, yeah, right there. Uh huh. It learning, it into... learning communities. Well, oh, there Is you that... go. Learning communities, yeah? Not uh -huh. learn, uh, yeah? Yeah, maybe not communities of practice. Communities of practice is a very particular term that Wenger uh, developed. You know, they actually do go and, and, and they reference Wenger. I think down here, what's the community of practice? Educational theories, et cetera. Uh, Etienne Wenger suggests that a school must be more than a place of instruction, it must be a place of inquiry, a place that produces knowledge, uh -huh, transmits knowledge. Okay, designed with the intention of helping members systematically understand and improve their own practice. Yet, what a com learning community looks like and how it functions is dependent on the community members' intentions, the design and structure of the community, and the activity that takes place among the community members. And I would think that community members drive that in a, in a community practice. So it wouldn't be something you could implement top down. Yeah. So, you know, and, and you wouldn't be able to sustain it if you did, because, you know, the so community practice should be something that is sustainable. Yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, and the way, so there's a, there's a difference between, you know, communities of learning and community of practice, mate. Learning community, sorry, and Oh, yeah. community of inquiry. So actually, that's it. Okay, cool. Community of inquiry. That's uh, garrison. Um, the uh, social presence, the teacher presence, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Should we make some kind of big wave and smile and take a screenshot or something? Oh, no, hang on a minute. I was just about to hang on. Uh, oh, how can I? Oh, yeah, pursue, there we go. Okay, got it now. Okay. So, uh, all right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Appreciate it. Yay. See some hands. Yay. Okay. All at once. One more time, step one. Yes. Hey. Okay, we got three hands. All right. <laughs> okay, great. Cool. Okay. Uh, Once if it's possible, I, I received two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, asking the first one uh, is asking about how can teachers be lifelong learners? Or the other one actually is clearer, asking about how teachers, how can teachers be autonomous? Yeah, uh, I... I... Uh, mentioned lots of articles that I've written where I address these things, but and those those questions kind of get at the. They're hard to answer, <laughs> but let's see if we can try. Okay, so the first question: How do how do you, how do you become autonomous? Um, kind of what Mike is talking about, where he's into this ludic uh, group. It's not autonomy means that you want to learn about this, and you go and you find things, and whereas they're sort of coming top down on you, read this, read that, you know, so um, that's kind of counter to autonomy, isn't it? So autonomy is where you, you, uh, 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 I think it said in one of the slides I quoted that it's uh, where someone gets a strategy to where uh, they find a way that they can learn. So autonomy is where you develop a strategy for learning and then you, because you want to learn it, whether it's another language or it could be, uh, I'm sure probably in your practice, you've probably learned a lot of things uh, that people didn't really teach you. So if there's a gap in your knowledge and you wanna fill that gap, then if you go and try to do that, that's autonomy. And you and it said in the quote that I'm thinking of in my slide presentation also that that's going to involve the community somewhere, a, a personal learning network, probably these days, it's hard to learn on your own. So you need a support group, a support community to help you with that autonomy, to develop that autonomy, but it's something that has to come from within. What was the other topic? Autonomy and what else? Yeah, I, I think it's very much related. Yeah, about how teachers can be uh, learners. Ben, lifelong some learners. Nice comments on that. Yeah, lifelong learners. Uh, yes, well, that's, that's actually what, what uh, David Warlick was talking about, you know, uh, teachers 
practice, sorry, teachers uh, model and demonstrate and learners practice and reflect. But if you are a lifelong learner, you're doing all those things. So uh, your, your reflection could be keeping a, a blog post or something like that, or keeping a blog or um, going to conferences, doing presentations. You're obviously reflecting on your practice if you do that. Uh, teaching other people how to do things in professional development groups or in your community of practice. These are all reflective practices, uh, helping people to to learn. So if you are in that kind of thing, uh, if, if you enjoy that, you're you know a lifelong learner in this day and age. If you're not a lifelong learner, you'd have left technology, technology would have left you behind some time ago. So you have to keep learning. And um, if you keep that up to the end of your life, then you're a lifelong learner. <laughs> You've got a ways to go, Stefan. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I believe, uh, Vance, there is a comment on the chat box by. Okay, not to bring it up here. All right. Uh, where does it begin? Thank you, Vance, for a, a great talk to be autonomous, perhaps in your appeal, and are those of you? Someone want to come on and articulate this, what they want to say? Sometimes it's easier if, if I read it. This was uh... Benjamin. Yeah, Vance. Yeah, mm -hmm. just wanted to thank you for the talk. It was very informative. Like to see what all you're doing, and it's been a while since uh, I've been uh, following you. I've been with some doing some other stuff, but um, I've just twigged things... on who you are. Your face is coming yeah. very clear now. Yeah, <laughs> cool. All right. So nice to see so, you again. Uh -huh. One of the things that I think about when I uh, regarding the question about autonomous learning is just the personal learning network. And I think this falls into your talk on communities of practice where you're really thinking about your own personal goals, building your relationships with other colleagues, maybe colleagues that you work with face to face. Maybe these are colleagues that you're connecting with outside of your workplace, much like what we're doing here and really thinking about how you maneuver and leverage your network. That is those that you build relationships with, the ideas, the concepts, the personal goals that you wanna set for yourself, and then manage that personal learning network through let's say a community as a practice or, or, or not. Maybe it's just a more of a individual pursuit that doesn't fall within the principles of a community as a practice. So I think, the idea of a, being an autonomous learn, learner, especially as a teacher, that's, that's very important. And as you mentioned, knowing how to be a good learner is, what it's, is where it's at, you know, in terms of how we demonstrate and help our learners do take on those same ideas and practices, perhaps. But it's really just trying to um, find what works for you and, and looking at a personal learning network as an is constantly changing as you're developing and learning yourself and just just taking that responsibility of of making those decisions about reaching out find, finding communities like you're offering here and and reaching out and connecting with others and sharing your experiences and just do those practices that help you learn for me that's that's where it's at in terms of just how, how I view becoming a, a lifelong learner or or develop, developing a, a personal learning network. So I've done a lot of research on PN, PLNs and I did my dissertation on that. Um, for me, the personal learning network, even though it's been kind of an old term now, uh, it's been around, I still feel it's very relevant in how we view our own personal development and mm -hmm. professional development. But again, and thanks for the talk. I really, I really do appreciate the, the time and uh, everyone's participation and insights. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate that. And so, yeah, you put it very nicely there. If you have anything we can read, you can put it in the text chat. All right, so thank you very, very much, Vance. That was quite informative. And to be honest, you, you've just made me reconsider the whole piece of career I've built in. <laughs> you know, so yeah, the more knowledgeable people you see in the field, the more you know that you still need to know much and much and much and more and more.
Yeah, well, if it, uh, like like the connectivists say, if you develop your networks, you can get their you can get knowledge from your network, uh, even if it's not from the person who has it. it. Could be from someone who's talked to the person who has it. But anyway, yeah, uh, the, the knowledge is there in the network, and the wider your network is, the, the more uh, you're able to access that knowledge when you need it. So. And uh, you talked about uh, modeling and things, and you are but truly a role model. I mean, for for us, and the same thing when it comes to also Mike, we we learn a lot from you, and we just need to put that into more practices. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. I know My it pleasure. was last minute, no, but it was really great, and it's highly appreciated. Hey, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your having me at this. Uh... Uh, you know, sort of an add-on, but I really appreciate your including me. So that's very nice. Of you. You're honored and looking forward to seeing you in other conferences. Okay, sure. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Benjamin. I, it was your voice that made the connection. I knew that voice. Yeah. <laughs> and then I knew the smile. Okay. So cool. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Vance. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Okay. All right.